So before we get started, this video was a request by one of the wonderful Subscribe Star Bros. It's the final step in the Apocalypse trilogy and is hands down the greatest, as well as probably one of top three Carpenter films of all time, and among the best science fiction horror films ever made. It's time for... The Thing. It's Bennings! The Thing is one hell of a movie. It's the first title in the Apocalypse trilogy, coming out in 1982, and is the one that holds the crown among the three. The level of fame this movie has gotten is insane, to the point that even trying to introduce it feels weird, because what can I really say beyond it's The Thing? Alright, in actuality, here's what the movie is. The Thing follows a group of researchers in a government facility stationed in Antarctica in the early 1980s. One day, they see a helicopter crew from the Norwegian base just a few miles away, shooting at a dog. The men are tossing grenades, opening fire with no consideration that they technically stepped on American property, and even seemingly starts to fire on them once they notice the dog is cuddling up to the Americans. The Norwegians are killed, one by accident due to a dropped grenade, and the other killed by the station commander, Gary. And the men are left wondering just what the hell happened, unknowingly taking in a dog that's actually a shape-shifting alien parasite, one that works its way through the base, infecting everyone it can find, and trying to take over every life form. Now, The Thing is an extremely famous movie, on multiple levels. Not only is it referenced constantly by other media, the idea of an alien parasite that shapeshifts to become a human being became iconic to science fiction directly because of this movie, but the stories around making the movie became well known as well. The Thing is John Carpenter's baby. It's the one that you can clearly see means the most to the guy, and this isn't just speculation. The movie's most quoted details that's actually a remake to the 1951 science fiction horror thriller The Thing from Another World, which also followed an alien monster attacking scientists at an Arctic research base, which was also an adaptation to the 1938 short story Who Goes There? Universal bought the rights to RKO Pictures, who originally made Thing from Another World, and they approached numerous directors to see if anybody was interested in remaking it, their first choice being Toby Hooper, because of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but creative differences made them split from the project. John Carpenter was actually approached pretty early on, funny enough, but he was still seen as an indie director at the time, they weren't sure if he could handle a big studio film. After constant rejections and failures, the remake was put on ice. Up until Ridley Scott's Alien exploded in popularity in 1979, making the general public hungry for more science fiction horror films. This made Universal want to cash in on the golden goose that 20th Century Fox just revealed, so they were back on the grindstone. But after going through their long list of names, they were left with no other option but to let Carpenter direct the remake. John Carpenter was actually a big fan of the original movie, even sneaking in a reference to the film in Halloween, so he was willing. Carpenter loved the original film, but wanted to tackle it in his own unique way, so he took more influence from the short story itself, which is actually closer to the 1982 film than you would think, since it also talks about an alien infection that takes over living beings. He mixed this with elements of Agatha Christie novels, specifically And Then There Were None, a murder mystery that focused on a group of protagonists slowly being picked off by a mysterious killer. Now, the script had several writers, multiple names shuffled in and out as the studio scrambled to get the movie out and off the ground. Carpenter didn't really want to write it, he was just kind of exhausted of screenwriting, so instead he was just finding the director's chair and wanted the job to go to somebody else. The guy who wrote Logan's Run, William F. Nolan, actually wrote a draft before, but the main name credited is Bill Lancaster, who's actually the one behind a lot of the iconic scenes in the movie, like the blood test scene and the Norris jump scare, both of which are now some of the most famous scenes in cinema, and according to trivia, were what got John Carpenter interested in it in the first place. Ennio Morricone was also picked to do the score, able to emulate the style of a John Carpenter theme pretty damn well, and this score would actually later be used in The Hateful Eight by Quentin Tarantino. But the two didn't really communicate during the process. According to Ennio Morricone, Carpenter was a tad intimidated by the idea of working with a legend like him, so they kind of wrote their own music without input from the other, and just picked and chose what would work with each scene, sometimes not even using score and just letting the scenes run silent. Now, the most well-known person who worked on this movie is hands down Rob Botton, the man behind the special effects for the creatures. The amount of creativity and detail behind the monsters in The Thing barely even needs introduction. The monsters steal the show out of sheer design and quality, able to have so many different forms and yet still follow this recognizably alien throughline. 
At no point do the monsters ever feel nonsensical or like they're from a completely different movie. Nothing ever feels cheesy or goofy, beyond like one or two moments. Instead, they manage to stick in your mind as these horrid amalgamations of meat that just provoke instinctual fear. Which is especially funny because the original movie was just a blood-drinking Frankenstein-type monster. So to go from that to something like the dog monster is one hell of a culture shock. But that was always sort of the intent. Rob Botton worked his ass off on the special effects for the movie, to the point he put himself in the hospital with double pneumonia, exhaustion, and a fucking ulcer. And right there by his side, actually working on the designs of the creatures, was Stan Winston. Famous for The Terminator, Aliens, Predator, you get the idea. So two heavy hitters were working on the special effects, nearly to insanity and an early grave. Which makes the actual release of the movie all the more funny, but we'll get to that later. Still, in the modern day, the effort is more than appreciated, even if it took some time for the general public to really get it. Hell, the techniques they used for the effects are taught in film schools to this day, and one of the biggest compliments a grisly alien horror movie could get is, it reminds me of The Thing. Now, the story is sort of seen in one of two ways. It's either a tightly written thriller that emphasizes paranoia and mistrust, showing how this group of characters begin to eat each other alive as the threat of the thing looms over them, or it's a slow-paced creature feature where it's more about waiting for the next reveal of a freaky monster, with characters being ancillary and more just there to give a body count. You either obsess over the tone and style of the movie, or the special effects. And neither road is illegitimate, the thing manages to do both very well. Now, some of you guys might find the cast as simple and disposable, but personally, I really enjoy the characters. No, they don't have the most fleshed out backstories, but that was never the idea for them. You're not supposed to learn about who they really are, just what their job is at the research outpost and how they fit in with the rest of the guys. You're barging into the camp in the middle of their routine, and you figure them out from how they react to the situation. It also helps that every actor in the movie does a damn good job. The obvious standouts being Keith David as Childs, Wilford Brimley as Blair, and Kurt Russell as McCready. They're the powerhouses, but that's not to say everyone else should just be forgotten. While they aren't exactly the most well-known cast, I mean, Charles Hallahan was known for the Twilight Zone movie and MASH, and Thomas Waits was in The Warriors not too long before the thing, everyone bounces off each other very well. The chemistry among the cast is one of the highlights to the film. Able to go from joking around and smoking like chimneys, it was the 80s, half the budget to the facility probably went to cigarettes, to each other's throats and ready to kill one another, and it never felt like it was rushed. The conclusions the characters reach make sense for them. They're given time to think about the situation, realize what the creature is capable of, and see their friends being picked off around them. The insanity and rising tension is absolutely nailed in the thing. By the end, the whole cast is exhausted, half insane, getting more violent and ruthless as they become desperate to kill any infected. The only way to clear them out for good being to light them on fire and destroy every single cell. Which leads into something I really want to talk about. What makes this movie special to me is how much personality the alien has, even if it never says a single word. Just the way it acts, how it's able to slip into a location and start infecting. You never really know why it's doing this, whether it's operating off instinct or malicious intent. Is it capable of knowing what it's doing is wrong? Does it simply not give a shit? The monster, despite appearances, is intelligent. It might even be the smartest thing on the planet. It absorbs the knowledge of its victims, able to replicate them perfectly down to their personalities, so it can weaponize bonds and paranoia to its advantage. The only reason they can even be hunted down is because the characters themselves are intelligent. The thing differentiates itself from a lot of alien slasher movies. Instead of just tossing disposable nobodies at the screen that get picked off one by one because they're idiots, the characters in the film wise up to the situation very fast. By the 30 minute mark, they're able to decipher that it's an alien shapeshifter that will attempt to replicate anything around them, and it takes no time for them to come to the chilling realization that the creature will attempt to replicate them as well. In fact, they're so not stupid that the alien can use their intelligence as a weapon against them. Blair is quickly driven into insanity as he studies the corpse of the first thing monster they encounter, knowing that the creature making it back to civilization would be the end of the world. The characters know that anyone around them could be infected, that a single second they leave their sight is an opportunity for the monster to infect someone. Common sense dictates the logic of the movie, and it's what gives the thing so much identity. The characters play this cat and mouse game with the alien, learning about what it did to the Norwegian team, what its weaknesses are, and the creature schemes once it takes over the camp. It makes the alien feel that much more, funny enough, human, compared to something like the Xenomorph, which is just operating off killing instinct and doesn't really have higher thought function beyond that. The parasite in The Thing is a character itself, just spanning multiple actors. It's something you appreciate when you see the film more than once and you already know who is infected and who isn't. The creature is actually very clever in its tactics. You'd think it would target camp leadership first, to take control of the head and work its way down, but it doesn't actually do that. Now to talk about this, I'm going to need to put up a spoiler warning. It's weird to do this because, I mean, The Thing is such a well-known movie that 95% of you guys watching have probably already seen this. Regardless, spoils. Go watch this movie, because it's fantastic. 
So the way the parasite works is that it infiltrates the camp as a dog, taking its time to scout the camp out, memorize the layout, and get to know the dynamic of the crew. There's a scene where we see the dog enter the room of an unknown crew member to assimilate them. It's later revealed that it was most likely Palmer? as he's revealed to be infected at the end of the film, plus the shadow kind of looks like him. Actually, the silhouette is a stunt man who was chosen specifically, so it's harder to guess who was infected by the dog. So while it's very possible to be Palmer, it could also be Norris, who is also exposed as an imposter later in the movie. The only one you know for sure it couldn't have been was Blair, since even with the bait and switch, the shadow looks nothing like Wilford Brimley. Now assimilated, Palmer makes subtle jabs at the crew that stokes tension and breeds discontent, such as refusing to go out on a patrol with Windows and insisting he wants to go with Childs. I ain't going with Windows. I ain't going with them. I'll go with child. At the time, it's not really something you think about. Childs and Palmer are shown to be friends in the beginning of the film, getting high and watching game shows together, and this patrol happens when things are starting to boil over and everyone's on edge. But in retrospect, it's obvious that the creature intended on infecting Childs, because him and McCready are wrestling for control over the group, something that the parasite can exploit if it got the opportunity to infect one of them. It noticeably stays away from positions of authority at first. It never infects Gary, who was the commander, and even tries to frame him for sabotage, something that would have gotten him executed if less reasonable heads prevailed. And when it got the chance to be the camp leader as Gary tries to hand the job over to Norris, who is actually infected, he shies away from it. I'm sorry, fellas, but I, I, I'm not up to it. The parasite knows that being in charge puts it at risk, because any decision that got somebody killed instantly puts suspicion on itself. So it wants to sink into the background, to have just enough of a presence to stoke up paranoia, but never actually be in the spotlight. Compare this to the actual protagonist of the film, McCready. Mac is unafraid of stepping up and taking control, exuding a fuck you, I'm in charge energy that naturally pushes him into the leadership position. I'm going with child. Hey, fuck you, Palmer! I'm going with you! Who says I want you going with me? All right, cut the bullshit! McCready, by the way, is one of Kurt Russell's best roles, easily. Sure, he's not as naturally charming or funny like he is in Big Trouble in Little China, but the cold, ruthless aura he has is impossible to ignore. When he threatens to kill somebody, you really feel like he's gonna kill somebody. And that aggression is why he's able to fight off the aliens so well. He has zero patience for manipulation and doesn't trust a single person around him. It was actually written in an early draft that McCready was a pilot during the Vietnam War, but something went wrong during a mission that left him bitter and traumatized, explaining why he drank so much and would even have had insomnia. There was a line that alluded to the idea. You're gonna have to sleep sometime, McCready. I'm a real light sleeper, child. They backed off on it, preferring the more everyman vibe of simply never explaining the idea, and I think that's for the best. It lets McCready rise above being an archetype, the typical traumatized badass veteran. That's more Snake Plissken. Instead, McCready's allowed to be his own man, to allow the traits of the character to shine through naturally, rather than be told to us in a lore dump. It's more impressive that this guy who is just seen as a schlubby helicopter pilot reveals himself as the greatest enemy to the parasite. Not the doctors or the scientists, this blue-collar guy who could put two and two together and outsmart this monster. And the funniest part is that the studio really didn't want Kurt Russell for the role. At the time, he was considered a pretty boy in Hollywood, not anybody that could handle a violent, gruff character, to which I would say, bitch please, but regardless, this was what Universal thought at the time. But McCready from the beginning is shown to be multi-layered. His introduction is him playing chess on a chess wizard, able to put the computer on the back foot and almost win, only for it to pull an unexpected move and get him in a checkmate, which he responds by pouring booze into the circuitry out of frustration. This says a lot more about the guy than you might realize. For one, he's much smarter than appearances would suggest, able to think out his moves and plan ahead. And when cornered, he's unafraid of just saying fuck it and burning the whole thing down to make sure his enemy doesn't win either. Both traits play into the ending of the story, and the idea of appearances being deceiving is a major aspect of the film, which leads into a funny story about one of the smaller characters. So there's a guy by the name of Nulls, shorthand slang for New Orleans, played by T.K. Carter. He's a memorable character because he's set up as just kind of a small role. He's the station cook that's there to provide some of the comedic relief. Well, another actor actually read for the role as well, Franklin Ajaye. I have no idea if that's pronounced right, fuck it, who is a well-known comedian in the 80s. He came in to read for the part, but instead of actually doing that, he went on a massive speech about how the character was a racist stereotype. Shocker, he didn't get the role. And honestly, it's kind of funny to think about, because nothing about Nulls is a stereotype or offensive at all. Yeah, he's a black guy from New Orleans who talks with a Cajun slang mixed in. People like that exist in real life. It's exaggerated, but it's a movie. Everything has to be exaggerated for it to work and be entertaining. Knowles is actually one of the guys who makes it to the very end of the film, too. 
dying off screen when he's lured away by the last remaining infected, but he's a reasonable, grounded guy. His jokes aren't over the top, they're sarcastic jabs at the rest of the crew, and they're at moments where downtime would make sense. When the realization of the infected hits the camp, Knowles is just as rattled as the rest of them, even going so far as fucking over McCready when he's tricked into thinking he's infected. Nothing about Knowles is a stereotype. Nothing about Childs is either, the only other black guy in the film. They're written to where their race is pretty ancillary to who they are. They could have had a white guy play Knowles and it would be just as valid, since white Cajuns exist. It's pretty funny that a guy missed out on a chance to be in one of the most famous science fiction films in cinema history because he missed the point of it this hard. Since every character is far from just being a stereotype, it's a movie led by its cast. Their performances and their ability to keep up the rest of the group is the whole goal of the film, because each actor is working towards the larger goal of showing this group fall apart. Now another thing to mention is that, yeah, the cast is all men, which actually brings another interesting level to the movie, at least to me personally. The only female voice you hear is the speaker for the chess wizard, which is Adrian Barbeau, since she was John Carpenter's wife at the time. Your move, Bishop to Knight 4. My move, Knight to Rook 3. The whole story is just this group of 12 men dealing with an alien, and I think that's actually pretty interesting. Once again, my favorite part of this movie is how the group devolves and goes at each other's throats. Well, a large part of that is that there was already building frustration the group had with working at the outpost. They're tired, bored, and comment how the conditions already put people on a mental edge. Add a parasite that can take the form of anyone around them and the already frustrated crew explode into violence fast. Since you're seeing already bottled up anger, let loose and escalated by fear of death or worse. And the most frustrating part about the whole situation is that to actually kill the monster, all you really need to do is light it on fire. Just corner it and light it up with a flamethrower, or a flare, or any other weapon they have on hand. The humans in the camp have the tools to fight off the parasite, it's just that it's clever enough to play them against each other. All you have to do is corner the monster, but the monster is smart enough to know how to get out of that corner. The characters in the movie just want this over with, since even if they kill the alien, they still have to wait months all alone in the Antarctic because it's just hit the winter season, meaning any chance of rescue or extraction is near zero. The weather is just as much an enemy as the alien. If anything, the alien knows how to use the cold to its advantage. It's already slept for thousands of years under the ice. Meanwhile, the humans will die in minutes. They have to take their time to scout the camp, making sure not to get lost in the storm or spend too much time outside. Meanwhile, the alien's free to come and go as it pleases. It can sabotage whatever it wants with little worry of long-term repercussions. In fact, that's exactly what it does towards the end of the film, when it tears out the generator so the power to the camp is shut off planning to freeze out the surviving humans in retaliation for them discovering a test that can confirm whether or not someone's actually infected or not. The cat and mouse game only grows more intense the whole movie, and you can almost spot moments where you can see the alien is frustrated as well. When they perform the test on Palmer in the famous blood jump scare, you see how defeated he looks. Every other character is poking at McCready, accusing him of making everything up, insisting he's cheating, anything to get under his skin. Meanwhile, Palmer is silent, because he knows Mac figured him out, and he's just sitting there like a kid who got in trouble, fully dedicating to the fuck it mentality, and starting to transform right in the middle of the room, attempting to kill them all before they can get the chance to burn them, and he does successfully kill Windows. Another scene is when they set explosives around the camp, realizing that Blair is infected and has in fact burrowed under the camp to build a vehicle that would allow it to reach the mainland, stealing supplies and sabotaging every other vehicle, which proves that he's been infected since early into the situation, as he was intentionally keeping himself separated from the rest of the group in order to work on his escape plan. Well, when McCready, Nulls, and Gary begin to set the charges in the compound itself, they go down into the generator room, where they find the entire thing is now missing. Gary goes to set one of the bombs, and is attacked by Blair, who suddenly arrives and shoves his hand into his mouth, tentrils flooding into Gary and killing him, giving the alien another body to assimilate. What's interesting about this is the fact that McCready and Nulls are right there. This is an extremely risky move that could have easily went wrong if Gary so much as yelped loud enough. But by this point in the movie, the alien itself is tired and frustrated. This is the second time it's been hunted down by a group of humans it wanted to assimilate. While we can't possibly know what it's thinking... Okay, I'll talk about that in a sec. I like to think this thing fucking hates McCready and does not care anymore. Plus, it was already figured out, so what's the point in hiding anymore? Something sort of backed up by the final confrontation. After Nulls goes to check on Gary and never comes back, the creature makes a show of trying to kill McCready, burrowing under the snow and snatching the detonator from him, forgoing any sense of subtlety and revealing the amalgamation of meat it currently is. This final confrontation feels especially bitter with how monstrous the final form of the alien becomes, and of course, McCready's famous quote. Yeah, fuck you too! 
The Thing to me is a story of two sides that fucking hate each other. The alien parasite angry at being hampered at every step, and the humans going insane with paranoia and rage as their numbers dwindle down. Even the final confrontation is done just out of spite. Sure, the men wanted to be sure the creature never made to civilization, but they did this fully expecting they were gonna die. They accepted it, but wanted to be sure they took the alien with them, because fuck this asshole. Now, the big question the film leaves you with is the very final scene of McCready and Childs drinking together in the ruins of the camp, waiting to freeze to death as they both think the other is infected. There's a ton of fan theories based around this scene. Childs is actually infected, McCready figured it out by giving him a bottle of gasoline, Mac is infected and just infected Childs with a bottle, the detail in the script that Mac had a flamethrower under his blanket and uses it to kill Childs off screen, all sorts of stuff. Now the ending is left fully ambiguous. There are other endings that were pitched before, that Mac and Childs were infected and rescued by the crew that comes in to figure out what happened, leaving the story with a more bleak ending, that him and Childs were both human but they watched birds fly out to the coast worried that they may be infected, which was a reference to the short story, typical shock twist that opened things up for a sequel, or a typical horror movie bad ending. Which is funny, because there's a made-for-TV version of the thing that ends with another infected dog that escapes the camp, ensuring this will all happen again. Shocker, this version has been disowned and you can't really find it anywhere. But Carpenter instead wanted to keep the ending more grey, to play off the paranoia that the entire movie has been about. You don't know how Mac and Childs got to those ruins. Childs went missing, and Mac supposedly got caught in the massive explosion. That doubt eats away at you as the screen slowly fades to black. Now personally, I go with the idea that both Childs and Mac are human, but neither know that. They both assume the other is infected, and they spend the minuscule amount of time they have left in suspicion, waiting for the other to transform. To me, that's just such a perfect way to cap off the story, that even with the last infected blown to smithereens, the paranoia it causes can't just go away. You will spend the rest of your life unable to trust anyone around you. Even if working together could possibly keep the two of you alive, you would rather freeze to death in the cold just to be absolutely certain that this thing is dead and buried. It's just brilliant, I love it. Now you can't talk about the thing without talking about some of the side media. There's a PS2 game that acts as sort of an unofficial sequel, following a special forces team that goes into Antarctica once they discover that both camps have gone completely silent. They investigate the ruins and stumble into the parasite themselves, now infecting every human in sight and all hell breaks loose. The game is more of an action shooter than the slow-paced, paranoia thriller that the original film is. It has some interesting ideas, like being a squad shooter where you have to be careful of the trust among your units, otherwise they could fuck you over or even kill themselves. The game itself is not the worst, but it's definitely a clunky PS2 game. Not all the ideas are really fleshed out, and the story is pretty generic, quickly turning into a military conspiracy type deal where there's an asshole colonel that wants to weaponize the parasite, because of course they do. This game is sort of a hit and miss, but it does have a cult following, which is sort of fitting considering the movie. And hell, John Carpenter actually has a cameo as one of the characters. When it released in theaters, the thing was sadly eaten alive by critics. For the crime of, well, having two grotesque special effects. And that the story was boring. And it's not as good as Star Trek or E.T. Yeah, around this time is when E.T. and Star Trek took over science fiction. Now audiences were sort of tired of mass murder aliens and wanted something more positive and happy, which is kind of dumb to ask from a director well known for horror, and in particular was a massive H.P. Lovecraft fanboy. Regardless, critics are idiots. But even the director of Thing From Another World said it was shit, which had to have stung, and is especially funny to think about since The Thing is remembered to this day, and Thing From Another World is just seen as a corny 50s B-movie. Now, another thing I want to talk about is the comic tie-ins. So, there's some comic books about The Thing. Some are sequels exploring McCready dealing with the aftermath of the Antarctica incident, finding himself battling the parasite again and again, and the other is a sort of prequel tie-in short story that explores the events of the film from the perspective of the parasite. That's right, you actually learn about the mind of the infection, and you might be shocked to learn it's a hive mind, which I mean, no shit. Still, every piece is part of a whole, and it's horrified to realize humans are individuals, outright referring to them as living cancers. I'm not too big on adding more stuff to the thing, but some of the stuff is alright. Some of the comics have some fun ideas and monster designs, and in particular, the short story The Things, which is the one that explores the perspective of the parasite, is a pretty good love letter to the movie. Some of the cast members actually gave it their blessing and said it was a pretty good addition to the lore. But to me, The Thing is just such a one-and-done concept. 
It shows up, does its job, and leaves. Trying to explain aspects of it or add on any more can easily open it up to repetition, because once you figure out how to spot an infected, well what can you really pull anymore? The secret's out. Trying to throw new people at the situation leads to them figuring out the same secrets McCready and his guys did before. Still, it's there for fans who absolutely cannot get enough of the thing. I admit some parts of it are pretty cool and has interesting designs for the monsters, even if Childs gets pretty fucked over in the sequel comics, which sucks because I always liked his character. And The Things is an interesting idea that just doesn't click with me personally, because it steps on the ambiguity of the monster in a way that just didn't do enough to make it work for me. I liked having no clue what was in the mind of one of the creatures. It let me have my own conclusions and consider things at my own pace. The short story is there for a cool hypothetical, something you can ponder and compare side by side with the movie, even if some parts of it don't make any sense. Like claiming Childs is infected even before the test scene, and the blood just knew not to react to the heat, or that Copper comes back from the dead as one of the infected. Some out there ideas I personally don't like with how I see the movie. Still, it's not the worst, and I do encourage everybody to at the very least check it out. You can read it for free. Now the last thing to talk about is the infamous prequel, coming out in 2011. Hey, thanks for thinking about it, though. The Thing is the remake to the 1982 classic, The Thing, and explores the events of the Norwegian camp incident and how it leads to the events of the original movie. To get it right out of the way, no. Nobody really asked for a prequel to The Thing, because the movie itself already covers all the territory you need for the concept. What the monster is, what it can do, how to fight it, a major aspect of the story is that the American camp is devolving and copying the same road that the Norwegian camp already did, desperately burning anything suspicious and tearing each other apart, to do a sequel runs smack dab into the issue of just doing the original story and pretending that it's somehow not playing with the same ideas. And the prequel, unfortunately, does do this. It ends up copying a lot of the same ideas, the discovery of the alien, the misguided research into it, realizing it's a violent monster that can replicate living beings, paranoia as the creature wreaks havoc, and even an attempt at a test scene that totally isn't just a ripoff of the blood scene. But the biggest issue I have with the prequel is that it winds up falling into traps that the original movie avoided. Characters are remarkably dumb in this, letting themselves walk into corners and situations that the guys from the original would have shot somebody for even suggesting. Another big issue is that despite it being the Norwegian camp, a significant chunk of the cast members are not Norwegian, they're Americans. So why didn't anyone write something down in English to explain what's going on, knowing that the American camp is a few miles down the road? That's kind of a major problem, you might want to let them know about the shape-shifting alien. Even the monster is noticeably dumbed down, doing shit like transforming in front of a victim instead of simply assimilating them right there, when it has perfect opportunity to axe a character off. Or, even worse, sprint through the whole base making loud-ass monster screeches and letting the crew get a good look at it while it's eating somebody. Probably the worst scene is when one of the infected is actually able to get on board of a helicopter. The perfect chance for it to escape into the wider world and win, except it decides to transform the guy sitting across from it, which spooks the pilot and causes the whole thing to crash and explode. If it simply sat there and waited, the creature would have won. But for some reason, it was super important to infect this guy right as the pilot was taking off and leaving. Even if... Uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead's character discovered the teeth fillings in the bathroom. She had no way of proving who they belonged to. If the Griggs infected simply stayed calm and let her make a fool of herself, there would be no way the pilots would make an excuse to stay, as they were leaving to evacuate a team member who, as far as they are aware, was suffering a medical emergency. Even the test just isn't as thought out. They discover that the creature can't replicate inorganic matter, so stuff like implants, jewelry, dental fillings will be spat out by the creature and ignored. Which, fair enough, makes sense. So they decide to check the mouths of everyone on the team to see if they're missing any fillings. Something extremely risky and stupid, and not even a surefire way to prove anything, because what if someone just didn't have fillings? Characters in the movie outright address that the test has holes. So I'm gonna get killed because I floss. They want to inspire the same tension as the blood scene, but they just can't, so they bullshit a Rocky test in order to create drama, and half the drama is the fact this test makes no sense, so it can't even try to stoke up the same amount of intensity. Also, the ending. The ending of the original movie is very thought out and paced. The men try to hunt down Blair, destroy his escape vehicle, then decide to explode the entire base to make sure the creature goes down with them. It's very much a case where, out in the open, the humans have the advantage. They just need to find Blair and kill him, but this is where the thing can be clever, getting them into traps, ambushing Gary and luring Knowles away, and then attempting to kill McCready when he's all alone. It's slow up until it's quick. The prequel ending actually isn't the worst idea ever, 
The main chick is left as one of the last survivors, discovering that the alien wants to go back to its crashed UFO in order to restart it and leave Antarctica, so her and Joe Egerton decide to hunt down the last remaining infected, leading to the main chick exploring the UFO and killing it with a grenade. This ending... stinks a lot. For one, it completely does away with the cat and mouse tension the original movie kept. It's a typical Halloween alien deal where the final girl has to run away from the big scary monster, which for The Thing is a major sin. But that's never been the original movie. Even when there was a setup for it with the Blair Thing chasing McCready before he could detonate the explosives, Mac just says fuck you and chucks dynamite at it, because he doesn't really care about living or dying. Making sure this creature is burned to a crisp matters substantially more. If one of the things jumped out to attack McCready, he'd just incinerate it, because he's done that with every other one he's seen already. And the most important thing to mention is the CGI. Yeah, a remake of one of the most iconic movies to practical effects is full of CGI. And not great CGI at that. Even for the time it came out, it was wonky as hell because it was a last resort. The crew behind the remake fully intended on using practical effects. There's even videos you can see of the production team tinkering with models, and they look great. But this movie was eaten alive by reshoots. Focus groups complained about scenes that had character development, saying that the story was too hard to follow, and most of all, that the practical effects looked too much like an 80s movie. So the studio shortened it, dumbed the story down, and filled it with CGI. I fucking hate corporate focus testing. And so does the crew behind the remake, because they have horror stories of having to make a completely different ending. The original ending would have had the main chick discover that the ship the parasite crashed to Earth on wasn't even its own. It was a prisoner on the ship, and it killed every other occupant, showing that this was a cycle that kept happening. America, Norway, even outer space. Every culture that this thing touches spirals into death and violence. There would even be a scene where she finds the dead pilot of the spaceship, which committed suicide in order to prevent infection. The scene with the glitched out hologram uh, was supposed to be the protagonist finding the corpse of one of the pilots hanging from the ceiling. A dark mirror to the scene where McCready and Copper find the dead Norwegian at the radio station. But this was cut for time, and instead you have a big CGI monster chase down a hallway. It's a fucking tragedy. I don't think the crew behind the remake had any ill intentions going in. They clearly wanted to pay tribute to the Carpenter film and act as a companion piece you could watch alongside the original. Just the fact they wanted it to be a prequel instead of just a straight-up remake is already a sign there, especially for the time it came out, because this was balls deep in the era of stuff like the Robocop remake and the Total Recall remake. Yeah, this had potential to be a lot more cynical than what we already got, which is saying something. But corporate interference caused this to be watered down to the point of redundancy. It sucks, but what can you do? Regardless, this is all I have to say about The Thing. It's a fantastic movie that still influences media to this very day. Resident Evil 4 and Dead Space have pretty heavy influence from The Thing, with their stories of alien infections and monstrous parasites. Hell, John Carpenter even said he would be willing to direct a live-action adaptation to Dead Space. The director of the movie that influenced Dead Space wants to direct an adaptation to the game. That's neat. Still, you all need to sit down and watch this movie. It's fantastic beyond description. It is creepy, intense, disgusting, badass. It's just a fucking awesome movie. I guarantee you'll love at least some part of this. It's gonna stick with you, so check it out when you can. But that's all I have to say about the Apocalypse Trilogy. We covered some pretty crazy stuff. Prince of Darkness was a pretty alright religious horror movie with some awesome ideas to it. In the Mouth of Madness is a classic Lovecraftian story told with so much style and fun. And The Thing is just a fucking awesome alien creature feature with themes of paranoia and mistrust. And god, these are just so good. They're so much fun. Please sit down and watch all these movies. You can pick out your own favorites. You can pick out which one you thought was the weakest. But all around, just watch them. Until next time, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. See you guys. first goddamn week of winter. Hey, loser. Do you want a shirt? Do you want a t-shirt? I have shirts now. Look in, look in the description for a link to a t-shirt you can buy. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll kill your family. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll poison your dog. If you don't buy the t-shirt, you're going to be the only person in town that does not have a t-shirt. Everyone's going to look at you funny. There's going to be social consequences to not having one of these t-shirts. I'm now making express threats of violence against you if you do not buy my t-shirt. I will call the police, tell them how they're not you know, you're not buying my shirt, they're gonna plant crack in your house, and they're gonna arrest you and then beat you up in a jail cell. Buy my shirt. Up 
Dark. 